Okay, good evening. Welcome, welcome to the Virginia Living Museum. We have an audience here on site with us this evening. Welcome, as well as our Zoom audience. Welcome to you as well. I'm Rebecca Kleinhampel, Executive Director of the Virginia Living Museum. And uh, here we are, we're gonna get started right away. We are recording this presentation and we'll be sharing that with you if you've registered with us uh, next week. If you'd like to ask a question from Zoom, please type that into the question box at the bottom of your screen. And uh, if you see a question in there that you're also interested in, just simply thumbs up that question and it'll move it up in the rankings for it to be answered uh, by our presenter at the end of our discussion. So tonight we're here to learn. Uh, Dr. Healy Hamilton joins us. Uh, Dr. Hamilton is a biodiversity scientist with NatureServe, and she's housed currently in Washington, D.C., but she's a native of California, uh, where she studied at UC San Diego, then came east for a bit to the Yale School of Environment, that went back west for uh, the rest of her education with uh, UC Berkeley, and um, we're so thrilled to have her here this evening. She has experience with the California Academy of Sciences and uh, is a member of the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Aside from all of that, Dr. Hamilton is passionate about seahorses. We know a little bit about seahorses here in Virginia, and Dr. Hamilton is going to share her passion with us this evening. So without further ado, Dr. Hamilton. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and to each and every one of you for emerging from the fog of COVID to see each other in three dimensions and support the museum and hopefully learn a little bit about the diversity of life that surrounds us and sustains us through the lens of one of the most magical, mysterious creatures on earth, and that is uh, the seahorse. Now, I will say that it was Rachel's predecessor, Nicole, who asked me to speak a few months ago. And I have a fairly busy schedule. So I'm like, yes, yes, of course, I would love to. I love natural history museums. I love seahorses. I love public engagement. So sure, I'll do it. She's like, great, send me a title and an abstract right away. It's like, okay, okay, I'll get to that. I'll get to that. And then just a couple of days later, she's like, how about this title? <laughs> so she wrote the title for me, like, uh, okay. Sure, sexy seahorses, family trees, and biodiversity. Okay, sure, sounds great. And then, of course, fast forward a few months later, it's like, wow, the talk's next week. What am I going to say to these people? And how am I going to put a talk together that uh, fits this title? So I really have attempted to do that. We will talk about seahorses who are indeed quite have quite a few sexy behaviors, and I think you know they're sexy. Um, but we're also going to talk about uh, the, essentially the tree of life, like the interrelatedness of all life. Where did seahorses come from? Who are their cousins and their aunts and their uncles? How did they evolve? What does it mean to be related to other parts of life? So we'll look at the family tree of life and then talk a little bit about why should that matter to any of us? Why, why do we care about the, all of life on earth and how it's related to one another. Like, what does that have to do with me? So we'll talk a little bit about biodiversity. Uh, so I'm going to take you on that journey, starting of course with seahorses, which truly have captured the imagination uh, of our, our imagination for literally for hundreds, if not thousands of years. I mean, the Roman god Neptune rode seahorses as he exercised his dominion over the world's oceans. Uh, in, in art, in culture, in, in myth, we've been fascinated and mystified by seahorses for all of human history because they have this neck that suggests sort of it's a horse-like neck, but then they have this bony plated armor, they swim upright, they have a tail like a monkey, Sort of, it's no wonder that early naturalists did not even know that seahorses were fish. And in fact, I was speaking 
with friends of the museum here today saying, isn't it amazing? How would you know that seahorses are fish? Because they just look so, so different. So even the earliest naturalists uh, tried to figure out what they were. Uh, Hippocampus, which is the name of the genus that all species of seahorses are found in. So all species are hippocampus something. Uh, hippocampus cuda, hippocampus reidae, hippocampus something. And hippocampus means, it comes from the ancient Greek, and it means hippos, horse, because we've established they're horse-like, and campos, meaning sea monster. So we didn't, we, we thought they were horse-like monsters of the oceans. We didn't even know exactly what they were. And from the um, earliest days of trying to classify life on Earth, some of you may know, uh, Carol Linnaeus, the originator of the system by which we classify all life on Earth today, in his first volume of uh, trying to classify life called Systema Naturae from the 1750s, he was the first person to describe a seahorse, Hippocampus, hippocampus uh, which is found in the Mediterranean. So We'll take a little tour uh, on some seahorses and, and their relatives with uh, photographs from uh, many of my friends and colleagues. Hippocampus breviceps, the short snouted seahorse, right? They, they range in size from less than half an inch. There are seahorses that are so small, pygmy seahorses so small, you can fit two of them on a quarter, on the size of a quarter. There are others that are 14 inches. They're like giant thick, bony plated animals uh, that literally are over a foot in size. And even though they belong to the bony fishes, they actually don't have scales like all other bony fishes do. They have a thin skin that stretches around uh, sort of bones that have been turned into bony plates and rings. So they sort of have an outer skeleton and because of this, they, they no longer have any ribs. So seahorses swim upright. They propel themselves through the water with a little fin on their back. Uh, and so they're really quite poor swimmers. They just sort of flutter around. They use their cheek spines to steer and their, their thin little um, back fin uh, in order for forward propulsion. And so they actually end up being some of the slowest moving fishes in the ocean which is good for me for reasons I'll tell you later when I'm gonna go study them in the, in the ocean. So they have those long snouts uh, that they use to suck up food and their eyes can move independently like a chameleon can. Uh, so they're, they're just highly unusual and extremely charismatic animals. This is the pot-bellied seahorse found uh, in New Zealand, one of the ones that's larger it's uh, not uncommon to see a pot-bellied seahorse that's 10, 11 inches. They're really quite large. And then on the opposite side, we have pygmy seahorses. Uh, there are now about eight described species of pygmy seahorses, six of which have been described just in the last decade. So every time we turn around, there's a new species of pygmy seahorse. And these are incredibly small. You can see this is macro photography. You're looking at individual polyps on a soft coral. And these animals are extremely small. Here is another pygmy seahorse, even smaller than the ones that we saw before. So they range from these tiny little animals to these quite large, impressive uh, in size. Looking at a few of the relatives of seahorses, try to find that fish. Can you see where its eye is, where its head is, its tail that is wrapped around? This is a pygmy pipe horse that could not be more invisible. Would you agree that this is just the most camouflaged animal you could imagine? And it's also really quite small. You can see, again, this is macro photography looking at tiny little individual um, algae. Uh, this is uh, the network pipefish, this intricate patterns. They come in all kinds of colors and patterns. Um, 
This is the flagtail pipefish. You can see why it's called that. It has this tail that spreads and um, there's quite a few species actually of flagtail pipefishes and they are almost always found in pairs and they're always sort of bopping like dancing and wafting usually under ridges under like ledges uh, in the ocean. Some of the seahorse relatives have turned into very worm-like animals. So this is a tiny little worm-like pipefish um, that lives, that's found just in mushroom corals. It lives in the individual uh, polyps of mushroom corals. And then perhaps the seahorse's most famous relatives are the sea dragons. Uh, the weedy sea dragon, and the leafy sea dragon, just astounding animals, both found only in the south of Australia and nowhere else in the world. And fortunately, lots of marine protected areas in the south of Australia. So these are two extraordinary species of uh, relatives of seahorses uh, that are just just astonishing the way uh, that they have evolved to essentially look like floating clumps of algae. The first time that I was in South Australia diving off a pier where these animals are known to hang out, and I've spent a lot of years underwater looking for seahorses and pipefish, and I turn my mask and it bumps against a clump of seaweed, which then slowly floats away. It's like, oh my God, I was looking for you and you ran into me before I even saw you and I'm a pro. What does that say? They are so well camouflaged. So seahorses really are sexy. That's not just the title we put together so that you would come to the talk. <laughs> um, seahorses form pair bonds. So males and females within a breeding season will choose one another and every day they will wrap their tails around each other and do a pair bonding dance that reinforces that bond through a whole breeding season. So they are, um, you know, they're like romantic ballet dancers of the world's oceans. They, they take their prehensile tails and they wrap them around each other and they sort of say, I know you and you know me and I'm yours and you're mine and we can go find food now because we know that we're together. One of the most extraordinary things about seahorses is their reproductive, how they reproduce. All seahorses in this world have true male pregnancy. No other animal in the entire world does that, that we are aware of. So there's about 46 different kinds of seahorses. And in every case, the female, shown here on top, has a little tube that she transfers eggs into an internal pouch that the male has. He receives the eggs. Fertilization of those eggs happens inside the male's pouch. Those growing embryos embed themselves in the internal pouch and they're nourished by the male where they grow inside his body. And then two to six weeks later, depending on the species and how big they are, he contracts and out of his belly come clouds of very well-formed baby seahorses. Now, for those of you who are fish nerds and know anything about fish reproduction, it's pretty unusual to have fish born this advanced. I mean, most coral reef fish, they do this spawning where the males just squirt sperm into the water column and the females just squirt eggs into the water column and you hope they find each other and they start life as a single cell and then just float in the ocean. Like not very much parental care. Their seahorses are on the opposite extreme. So, so when you do spawning like that, you release millions and millions and millions of eggs because only a few ever make it to adulthood. But with seahorses, they invest a lot in parental care, right? The babies grow inside the male's belly, so he can only give birth to a couple hundred at a time. But the advantage is they're born much more advanced with a higher chance to, uh, to survive and live to adulthood and create seahorse babies of their own. Uh, nonetheless, 
most of these baby seahorses will get eaten uh, before uh, they are able to grow into adulthood and reproduce themselves. So you can see why these fish are absolutely fascinating, um, especially to me as a biologist who's trained, I'm an evolutionary biologist, I'm a conservation biologist, and I'm dedicated to using science to conserve the diversity of life. Life's diversity is a product of evolution, and my research on seahorses and their relatives is trying to answer some basic questions, like where do seahorses come from? How many species are there? Uh, how are different kinds of seahorses related to one another? How are pipefish and sea dragons related to seahorses? Essentially, these are kind of like the kinds of questions you might ask of a seahorse family tree, if we're gonna use an analogy. So right, essentially, right, you're asking questions about that seahorse family tree. So think of your own family tree, right? It helps you understand where you came from, why you have red hair or blue eyes or freckles or you hate olives, you know, what did you inherit from your ancestors, right? So depending on how far back in time you go, it deepens your understanding of your origin story, of what characteristics you have, of where your ancestors came from and what you inherited from their past. And family trees can extend as far back in time as we can trace them, right? And of course, they actually keep extending back into history, whether we have evidence of a family tree or not. So the point I'm trying to make is that trees are patterns of ancestry and descent. They, the closer the branches, the more closely related two people are. The farther away the branches, the more distantly <clears throat> related people are, excuse me. And that branching pattern of the tree of life, it holds all kinds of clues and it tells all kinds of stories. And the same is true if we think of the tree of all life, not just my family tree or your family tree, but the tree of all life. So you're not supposed to be able to read this, just so that you know. <laughs> It's just sort of a picture uh, that represents the major branches on the tree of life, including plants and fungi and mammals and birds and reptiles and amphibians and spiders and all life. And what does that branching pattern look like? How is it related to one another? What can that branching pattern tell us about the pattern and the process that led to the incredible, this incredible diversity of life that exists on our beautiful planet Earth. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit and forgive me for the very pixelated nature of these, these two slides, but I just want you to zoom into one region so you can see, uh, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but basically I'm, I'm moving my cursor. Yeah, okay, um, so, in the bottom right, there's a shark and a ray. And if you look closely, the sharks and the rays, they're early branches on the tree of life leading then to other fish. We consider them more primitive. Higher up in the tree, later in evolution, the bony fishes arose. I'm gonna put a circle around them now. Um, and that branch here, it's represented by Nemo right, clownfish and a trout, there's really 28,000 branchlets to that branch in the tree of life. There's 28,000 different kinds of bony fishes that we know of. Seahorses just make up about 46 of them. Um, and so I just wanna instill us with this thought of trying to understand the pattern of the tree of life and what it tells us about life around us and how do we know what this branching pattern is? Because we live in an incredible world of modern biology. We, have, we live in an exciting time when we can literally look at what this molecule is, the double helix, deoxyribonucleic acid, right, DNA, the blueprint for all life that can be unlocked, read, compared, analyzed 
And we can see sort of this astounding elegance. There's four simple, simple letters to this code. Those four simple letters stand for four simple molecules. And when we read the pattern of those letters, we can compare them to one another across different, different individual organisms. So I'm actually gonna show you, this is an alignment of DNA sequences from many different organisms. So we're unlocking the code of life. We're reading it letter by letter by letter across different types of life, different species. And we're looking where is it the same and where is it different? And when they're more the same, we're closer together on the tree of life. And when they're more different, we're farther away. And we can read this and analyze it for all life on earth. If we do it for the Nemos in the world, right? So we're now when, when we do this in biology, we turn the tree on its side so that we can show what we call the branch lengths. And so you can see which are the ones that are closest to one another and which are the ones that are farther away. We can read the history of the process of evolution through DNA. And that is what me and my colleagues do for seahorses. And the first thing you have to do is go to all these incredibly wonderful exotic places all over the world and go underwater and find the seahorses in order to get little tiny tissue samples that allow us to unlock the DNA. So I've had the incredibly good fortune. This is actually a little out of date. I've been to a few more places since then. There's one in the Middle East I'm missing, Oman. Um, Australia, seven different times. It's a center of diversity for this group of fish. So what a, what a privilege to get to explore, explore the underwater world through the lens of seahorses and pipefish. This is getting ready for a night dive in the Philippines where the local little three-year-old is like, what are these crazy people doing? It's so hot out here. Why do you have massive amounts of wetsuits on? because we spend three hours underwater between 20 and 40 feet deep, just looking for invisible fish. That's why, and it gets cold even when the water's 80 degrees. In Fijian villages, showing what seahorses look like and teaching the teachers and teaching the students, like, look, you have seahorses in your own waters. Like, look how miraculous they are. And meeting with mayors of towns and taking the next generation of local young marine biologists, mostly women out uh, into the field with us. So true cultural privileges, uh, as well as sort of the biological uh, experience. And of course, it's no fun at all. I have a miserable time. I'm, oh, I'm like so happy underwater um, playing with these fish. And it's not just me. I have wonderful colleagues who have wonderful senses of humor. And we're always you know, running, running around having fun. And it's not always like perfectly crystal clear, beautiful coral reefs underwater. We do a lot of muck diving. In some places, it's really poor visibility and you're literally face mask up against seagrass blades just to try to see these fish. And ultimately what we're looking for here when we find one is to take a tissue sample. So we take a tiny, tiny little piece of either a tail fin or a, a dorsal fin, the fin on the back, and that's all you need to be able to sequence its DNA. And so here I'm just sort of depicting like you find a seahorse or a pipefish, you get a little tiny tissue sample. This one's much bigger than we actually take. And then you, you get those samples from many different kinds of seahorses and many different kinds of pipefish and pipe horses and pygmy seahorses and pygmy pipe dragons and sea dragons. And then you sequence the DNA and align it and look at who, who's similar, who's different, where do they all belong on the tree of life? Now, there'll be a quiz on this at the end of the talk, <laughs> just kidding. So we recently published the most comprehensive tree of life for all the whole family, almost 300 species of seahorses and all of their different relatives. And we're, I just want, and we did that looking at 
thousands and thousands of letters of the genetic code from different parts of different genes. And so we were able to reconstruct the history of life, the branching pattern of the tree of life. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of surprises that we found. So zooming in, I wanna talk about pygmy pipe horses. No one has ever even heard of them or knows that they exist in this room, right? They are absolutely invisible animals. They're amazing pygmy pipe horses. The top red box is around the genus Acentronura, which is found in the Pacific. And the bottom red box is found around the genus Amphilicturus, which is found in the Atlantic. Now, these animals up until now were considered sisters, cousins, like they're both pygmy pipe horses. They look absolutely identical. Like they look so similar. They're tiny little prehensile tailed, some have skin filaments, some don't, but they look almost identical. And our research showed this, what we call morphology, this shape, this size, this behavior, this prehensile tail, this tininess, this ability to grow skin filaments, this camouflage, all of that evolved totally independently in the Atlantic and in the Pacific. They're completely separate branches on the tree of life. We call that convergent evolution. Like bats have wings and birds have wings, but birds are birds, bats are mammals. They converged in developing wings. Pygmy pipe horses converged as a, as a way of making a living on, underwater. No one anticipated that. It was like, of course, all five of us who care jumped up and down like crazy. <laughs> But it is amazing that the pygmy pipe horses evolved independently in two ocean basins. One of the biggest mysteries that we've been trying to unravel is where did seahorses even come from? Pipefish look quite different. Like, you know, they're horizontal, seahorses are vertical. Uh, you know, there's a lot of behaviors that change. And we hypothesized what we found was that this animal, the winged pipefish, found in the tropical Pacific, this one's in the Philippines, is actually the closest living relative to seahorses. No one in a million years thought that would be, I mean, no one ever came up with that idea. We actually thought pygmy pipe horses, the ones we just talked about, were the intermediary, the intermediate between a pipefish and a seahorse. That's what everybody thought, but no one had proven. And it's not true. Pygmy pipe horses are not even related very closely to seahorses. This guy is. How does that work out? So there are many people looking into, now that we understand that, we can look at winged pipefish, Halicampus macrorhynchus, and look at seahorses. And we're doing it with CT scans. So we're looking at the bony internal structure to see if we can figure out where there are similarities that we never even imagined before. So, why, why seahorses? Why travel all over the world, dive underwater, sequence DNA, analyze DNA, write papers? Like, what, like why do that? Why seahorses? Well, I'm a conservation biologist. Seahorses live in some of the most important ecosystems on this planet. Seahorses are found in coral reefs all over the world. Coral reefs are some of the most diverse and economically and ecologically and culturally important ecosystems on this planet. Seahorses are also found in seagrass beds. Seagrass beds are also extremely important. They sequester carbon. They are nurseries for the babies of what become commercially important fish. Uh, they um, absorb sea level rise and storm surge and protect coastal infrastructure. So seagrass beds are extremely important ecosystems. Mangrove forests, I cannot tell you how many hundreds of hours of my life have I've spent snorkeling, looking through at every root that dangles down from every mangrove for that one that's gonna have the tail wrapped around it because there are lots of seahorses found in mangrove forests. And again, these are, extremely important ecosystems, ecologically and economically, and they are in decline, and seahorses are found there. 
So we can use seahorses that people believe in, that they, they want a world that seahorses are in, and we can use them as flagship species to accelerate marine conservation. And we need to do that. We need to protect seahorse habitats because seahorses themselves are under stress. They are threatened by traditional Chinese medicine where there are many, many different ailments that seahorses and some of their relatives are believed to cure, aversion to cold, old age, anemia, impotence, like there are many different things that these fish are considered to cure, but essentially they're fingernails. They're fingernails, they're made of keratin. They're made of the same thing fingernails are made of. There is, there has been some research into medicinal properties and nothing has been verified, but that does not stop a massive global trade. And I mean, I can't, when I first saw this image, I just cried and cried because I've spent so much time underwater looking for these animals and you never, they don't come in like schools. <laughs> and so the volume that is represented, the amount of removal of seahorses that this one store in this one Chinatown represents is astonishing and absolutely unsustainable. And traditional Chinese medicine, the, the harvest for, for medicine is not the only threat. Seahorses are also part of bycatch in the world's oceans. So we go, we go fishing for shrimp, but we do that by dragging nets along the ocean bottom and capturing everything. And then we only want the shrimp and everything else dies and gets thrown back, except for now seahorses are landed and sold to a middleman who then sells them to traditional Chinese medicine. So the, a lot of what is sold in traditional Chinese medicine is actually bycatch in fisheries. And so for those of you who are committed to sustainably eating seafood, there are lots of excellent educational materials to let you know what seafood is truly sustainable and what seafood leads to uh, the demise of seahorses, such as um, trawler caught shrimp. But there's a lot that we can do, a lot of tools in our toolbox to make sure that the seahorses uh, thrive into the future, seahorses and all their relatives. All around the world, there are marine protected areas. Almost 10% of the world's oceans are in marine protected areas. And there is a global commitment to expand marine protection to reach 30% we call it 30 by 30. There is a global effort underway that well over 100 heads of state have signed on to. It's called the High Ambition Coalition. And the planet is setting out goals to try to conserve 30% of nature by 2030. And so marine protected areas are a way that we can let the ocean rest. We can let it replenish. And there is abundant science that, just, that shows us that when we let nature rest, she will recover. And then we all win because the, the benefits of that spill over into areas that are adjacent to marine protected areas. So economically and ecologically, marine protected areas are part of the solution. We want the abundance that we see when we let nature rest. And marine protected areas, again, scientifically have been proven to recover both diversity and abundance. So that's one component of sort of hell, uh, of the world's healthy oceans into the future. We need the habitats that seahorses live in, the coral reefs, the mangroves, the seagrass beds. We need those habitats because they sustain us. Coral reefs uh, are a really important source of protein for a huge number of people uh, on, on the planet. And the ocean in general, when we protect it, ocean biodiversity feeds us, right? So if we even just think about the economic impact of recreational fisheries, right? We need to conserve marine biodiversity because we need it. The mangrove forests that uh, seahorses live in, those are really important to us. They are nurseries for commercially important fish. 
They grow really fast and sequester a lot of carbon. Their wood is used for growth in, um, for construction in local, many local communities that live in areas near mangroves. And they're actually even really good for beekeeping. So there's all kinds of benefits that mangrove forests provide. So biodiversity provides for us. We think of um, biodiversity sort of protecting us, like wetlands, they're like sponges that help sequester carbon and absorb the impact of sea level rise. So from species to ecosystems, the diversity of life is uh, protecting us. It's also making us healthier. Biodiversity in the ocean has incredible uh, potential for future medicines. These two lovely organisms are called sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers are not quite as cute as seahorses when it comes to flagship species for marine conservation, but they're the only animal that we know of right now that can regenerate their central nerve cord. How does that happen? We don't actually know yet, but it may have these amazing properties could lead to, lead to future medicines and especially treatment for stroke victims who've had part of their central nervous system affected the clue to recovery from strokes could reside in marine biodiversity in these sea cucumbers. Thanks to trillions of bazillions of floating plants and animals that we call plankton, the ocean soaks up carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. It gives us back oxygen. So marine biodiversity literally regulates the Earth's atmosphere. So there are lots of reasons to want, actually to need a world in which seahorses and their relatives thrive in the coastal marine habitats that they call home, and that we can think of them as just a representative for the type of conservation actions that we need to see to keep the oceans healthy, which in turn keeps us healthy, and of course, not, not just the ocean, right? We want a world in which all biodiversity thrives, where the whole tree of life that we are part of, that we are a branch on, that that whole tree of life is what sustains us. Um, we, we have just sort of barely touched our understanding of the food resources, the ecosystem services, the medicines, the engineering solutions, the art and poetry uh, inspiration that nature provides to us all. And that's exactly why institutions like this one are so essential in their communities. This institution's goal is to, to make a public more ecologically literate, to understand and connect you to the natural world that you depend on, even though you don't necessarily know that. So the, um, the mission uh, and the vision of Virginia's Living Museum is one that we all absolutely have, have to get behind and commit to. And the fact that you're here today is in fact your commitment to that. And those of you online, of course, as well. And then I'll just end by letting you know that um, that's what NatureServe does too. So I am the chief scientist at an organization called NatureServe. We are the world's first biodiversity information network. And we develop the science that is necessary to conserve the diversity of life on earth. That's, that's what we do. We're a non-advocacy science-based biodiversity conservation organization. Uh, and, uh, and that, you know, that is my, my day job and my, my inspiration. Uh, and on the side, I still get to do a little bit of seahorse work. Uh, is Sly Clyde here in the audience? Are you okay? So as it turns out, it's Doug, right? So Sly Clyde's actually is a sponsor of NatureServe. So our CEO in the black t-shirt is driving around the country from affiliate program to affiliate program across the NatureServe network. And Sly Clyde is sponsoring the carbon offset for that. And you'll see the van in the back. That's called the Van Humboldt got the Sly Clyde logo there on it and literally it is driving to every state in the U.S. and every province in Canada, which is the biodiversity network that is NatureServe. 
Uh, and we're very fortunate to have in the audience today, Doug Smith of, that is co-owner, founder of Sly Clyde's and NatureServe is really grateful for your support. And I hear your cider is outrageously delicious. I'm an IPA gal myself, so hard sell. So if you're interested in learning about NatureServe, I'll leave this slide up for a little bit of ways that you can be connected to our organization. And I hope that today in walking you through seahorses and how sexy they are and family trees, not just your own, but the tree of all life on earth and why we, want, why we need and value biodiversity, right? The representation of, of all life on earth and that sense of understanding where we came from so we can conserve all life uh, to sustain us where we are headed. Thank you all so much. Yeah, so the question, that's an excellent question. So our, our global conservation goal that we call 30 by 30, 30% of the planet by 2030 is a global goal for both terrestrial, for terrestrial, freshwater and marine environments. On land, we're at about near 17% near of the land surface is protected in some way. That doesn't mean it's always managed perfectly, but at least has some form of legal protection. Uh, and we're, we're at about eight and a half percent, cl uh, closing in on 10% for the world's oceans. So still a long way to go there. Yes, Jim. Right. So excellent question. Clearly, you are a biologist. <laughs> so the question was, uh, I showed those two kinds of pygmy seahorses, actually same species, one was pink, one was yellow. And they are perfect mimics of the soft coral in the genus Muricella that they are obligate to. So those seahorses are found only on that genus of soft coral and no other soft coral in the world. And if Muricella species were to decline, it would lead to a decline. They can't just jump off onto a different kind of soft coral because they'd be really visible. They are invisible. I have stare, you can only find them at night. So they live only in deep water. Muricella is a deep water coral. So you gotta go like 80, 90, 100 feet deep at night with flashlights and hope they move because you can't see them if they don't move. They are the most invisible fish I've ever found. Excellent question. Yes, sir, in the back. So yes, can I tell you a little bit about the seahorses in the Chesapeake Bay? Uh, a little bit. Uh, I bet you could tell us more <laughs> because, so I've never actually worked here in the Chesapeake Bay at all, but um, there's a fabulous little exhibit over there that shows you the species Hippocampus erectus, the lined seahorse. It's uh, kind of a very standard size seahorse, like maybe this big, a little longer if you stretch, stretch its tail out. It usually has extraordinary skin filaments, like they're, they're these lacy skin filaments that make them invisible in the seagrass beds and among the algae. Uh, there have been uh, long, I guess the trend in the population of seahorses in the Chesapeake has been declining for decades. And where we are engaged in seagrass restoration, we are seeing recovery. So it's a direct connection, seahorses, water quality, habitat. Uh, there are also pipefish here in the Chesapeake and you can see Signathus fuscus over there, um, beautifully patterned uh, pipefish that the ones here in the aquarium are relatively young. They get big, like, like big, like this big. I, I've, I have caught those before and I've just been blown, blown away. 
Yes, sir. So the question is about global warming and its impact on oceans. And it is true that because of the increasing concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels, the surface of the ocean is getting hotter and the ocean is getting more acidic. And when it gets acidic, things that have chalk skeletons, calcium carbonate skeletons dissolve. It's like osteoporosis of the ocean. So that is happening. It is happening more in some places than others. It's a very, very active area of research. We've also found some coral reefs that seem to be relatively resistant to either heat or acidity. And um, a lot of institutions are actually looking at the DNA and trying to understand what properties confer heat resistance and resistance to acidity. There's very, it's very hard to document a marine extinction. When do you say it's the last? I mean, stellar sea cow, okay. That thing is ginormous and we know that there haven't been another one seen for 200 years. Uh, the Chinese river dolphin, they looked for it up and down the Yangtze River for six weeks with like 50 boats until Nobody, nobody's ever seen one since 2006 when it was declared extinct, but those are big charismatic, you know, animals. So far, there's no seahorse that has gone extinct that we know of. There are two that are on the brink of extinction. It's probably not global warming that will push them over the edge. In this case, it's more water quality. They live in estuaries and upriver deforestation uh, agriculture that leads to fertilization that puts too much nitrogen and phosphorus in the water. So it's really more water quality that is declining for these two seahorse species that are, are close to extinction, but a lot is being done to protect them as well. Sorry, long answer. I'm like, who asked that question? Ian. Wow, Ian. Um, well, I'm not sure I'm even allowed to say this publicly, but my colleague Graham Short, the guy who had the, the you know, the, the two limpets covering his eyes, he's really the world expert on seahorse taxonomy. And he's been taking all of these CT scans to look at internal structure across seahorses and pipefish, all kinds of different um, species of the family. And yeah, he is convinced that all eight species of pygmies should be split off of seahorses and should be in a separate genus. Um, but we haven't finished writing that paper yet. So you can't talk about this, Ian. <laughs> this is our secret. Okay, can we please keep this secret? Because we don't want it to get out. Um, but the, I mean, these are sort of esoteric, like where, where do you put a split on the branching pattern of the tree of life? Like this is, there are biologists, especially those who work in natural history museums, as I used to, who this is their whole life's work. What is a species? What is a genus? How are species in a genus related to one another? And I sort of only touched upon why that's so important, but like, okay, here's just one quick example, sorry, but I can't not give you an example. So there is a species of tree in the Pacific Northwest, a species of yew tree that has a chemical compound in its bark that has been shown to be incredibly potent anti-cancer. Anti okay, but you basically have to kill the trees in order to get enough of this compound out of those trees. So if you study how species are related, of, how species of yews are related, we realized actually there's a species of yew tree, yew shrub, that's really closely related to the tree, but it's grown as an ornamental. It's like everywhere. And it has, it turns out, so we're like, well, maybe it has the same chemical compound in it because they're closely related. And not only did it, it had 300 times the concentration and they're everywhere. Right, so we can predict 
properties from one species to another if we understand how they're related. So it really, that's just one example of why it really, really matters. Uh, that may be a bit, a bit of the trick of the light that, that so, uh, sorry, the question is, cause I'm, I'm not sure they can hear on. Okay. So the question is in that picture where the male seahorse was giving birth and there were clouds of baby seahorses all around, there's still one little baby seahorse that's in his pouch and it looks like that one's bigger. So I can't answer that. I'm, I, I'm pretty much assuming it's a trick of the light because there is no reason they're all born at once and they all should be the same. And they don't hang out in the pouch after they're born. They're, they go into the water column and they're basically on their own. They kind of float away. Sometimes they might hang out with their tail wrapped around their dad's nose for a day or so, and then they float away. Yes. So Fiji was so interesting. So I've been to Fiji three times and um, there aren't as many different kinds of seahorses in Fiji as you would expect, given how unbelievably gorgeous the coral reefs are, especially the soft corals, or it's very well known for its soft corals. Uh, in part, they're, so they're really hard to find. And the only ones I've successfully found, like quite a few of, are the ones that live in the mangrove roots. And you spend a lot of time in the mangroves searching like root after root after root until you find that one that has the seahorse tail wrapped around it. And literally, you know, you can search for six hours before. I mean, they're not like everywhere. <laughs> uh, so, but Fiji is one of my favorite places in the world. The water is incredible. The corals are incredible. Uh, I do wish there were more seahorses to find there. Oh, so the last question is, how do carbon offsets work in our organization? Doug, what are you, how are you offsetting the Van Humboldt tour carbon emissions? Yeah. And do you, do you know how, like, did you get it from like Terra Pass or Conservation International or a forest? Do we know how, where that money is going? Oh, so oh, it's, oh, we, okay, we determined. All right, so the, the, basically, let me talk. I don't, we don't know enough about exact, I don't know enough about the exact transaction on the NatureServe front. But what I can say is uh, carbon offsets have a, they've had a little bit of a rough start and a bad rap in the 2000s. The idea is that you calculate the carbon that you emit that you can't help but emit. Like I fly for work all the time and I, you can calculate how much carbon is going to be emitted because of your activity. And then the idea is, can I, uh, contribute in a way that will soak up somehow the amount of carbon that I've emitted. And that can be anything from, well, we're going to make catalytic converters on 18 wheelers more efficient, but we can only do that if we have the money to invest. And the money comes from me paying $14 to offset my carbon between here and California. It's not a lot of money and it goes a long way. There's a huge effort in to measure carbon in forests and to protect forests so they can keep soaking up carbon that might otherwise get cut down. And so we can achieve forest conservation and carbon sequestration at the same time, like a win-win, a win for us all, a win for biodiversity, a win for the forests, a win for the atmosphere, and ultimately a win for us. 
Uh, so carbon offsets are getting more and more rigorous around their verification. And there are many different organizations that, that allow you to offset your carbon. I have offset all of my carbon in my life since 2005, because it's just, it's, it's available, it's not expensive, and it's just how we should be behaving on this planet since we do have the choice. Yes, sir. Oh my, okay, the ex, the, another excellent question from budding biologists over here. So Ian, <laughs> yeah, I've got Ian online. And um, so can, the, do the independently moving eyes, or do we have any evidence that the fact that seahorses whose eyes can move independently, do they process, does their brain process images separately or simultaneously, different images simultaneously? I have no idea. <laughs> It's a great question. I don't know anyone who's ever even attempted to act, measure how brain waves go through seahorses. I mean, we're not talking very big brains here. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all so much. You here in person. Thank you for coming out. And all of you online. I'm sorry, you're probably like looking right into my teeth or something. I'm so sorry. But thank you for joining us. And I'm going to pass it back off to Rebecca now. All right. Okay, so it's proven they are sexy. Thank you for sharing that with us, Dr. Hamilton. We thank uh, your organization, Nature Serve, and everybody loves Sly Clyde here locally. Glad they're in the audience as well. Um, and for the folks that are here, please, before you leave, uh, go over to the touch pole area across the museum floor, enjoy the seahorse exhibit there. Uh, perhaps look at the sustainable sea seafood information, take a card home there with you tonight. Downstairs in the gallery just below, we're creating a seahorse nursery. Uh, we hope that that will be open in the summer months. Uh, a few challenges, of course, with building and construction right now, but our staff is dedicated to the line seahorses, which you find here in our region and are part of the species survival plan for, for that uh, particular seahorse. So uh, thank you all once again. And this concludes the Naturalist Speaking series for this year. And we uh, hope you all enjoy a beautiful summer. If you like pollinators, come join us this summer for our amazing pollinators exhibit. It's an interactive, engaging uh, family maze here inside in the cool museum during the summer. And if you like the hardy weather, you can go out to our butterfly haven where we feature all native species of butterflies and their life cycle in our outside uh, habitarium all summer long. So join us and thank you, thank you. Look for us again starting next January for the Naturally Speaking series.